Listen Thank to you. your Let's face continue drink. my new video. I'm Gianmarco. And in today's video, we're going to talk about one of the most absurd, most disturbing, and most hallucinating cases that you've ever heard. And I don't know that I say this a lot, but have you ever found yourself doubting what your own eyes see, what your ears hear? Imagine a story that defies all logic, where reality is tinged with mystery and the identity of each of the characters blurs as if in a game of mirrors. And I challenge you to get to the end of the case trying to figure out what really happened. Because I'll try to tell you as people have experienced it. And above all, don't forget to put a little CE on to subscribe to my channel, especially because of hallucinating things. There are many. Very often when a person or a child goes missing, a very peculiar phenomenon happens where following the uproar and the dismay over the disappearance, it turns to a conscious silence, especially if that missing person actually is problematic. In such cases, most of the time the police solve it with person missing by their own will. And it is not strange if the community of which that person is a part, they simply forget about it and almost feel a sense of relief. For virally getting rid of that problem, Nicholas Berkeley was that kind of person or rather that kind of child. Often in trouble absent from school, a perfect candidate to be ignored by society following his mysterious disappearance, we are in St. Anthony. Texas, where Nicholas Berkeley lived with his mother, Beverly, and his 24-year-old half-brother, Jason, but theirs was not an easy life. His mother was a former heroin addict who later became addicted to methadone and other narcotics who had taken to working at Dunkin' Donuts, especially nights, to try to support her children to take care of little Nicholas so it was the rest of the family, and more specifically, the two children she had from her previous husband, both older than Nicholas. Of course, in such a problematic family, there is not only drugs or substance abuse, there is also physical violence, verbal, and mistreatment. And crazy! Adora and Carrie lived with two children within a rollout. The 24 year old brother Jason also had problems with the law, with drugs, and with violence. Jason and Nicholas had a very problematic relationship, and it all resulted in constant DI verbal and physical violence. Nicholas then rebelled. He would dock the school, he was threatening teachers, he was threatening his own classmates. Any problems you can have in adolescence, Nicholas was doing them tenfold. On the 10th of June, Mill 994, Nicholas is out, having fun with his friends. He's playing in the playground with all his classmates, and at some point he needs to go home. He's tired. Try, try, he wants to, to walk the road again, who calls home and answers in the phone. It's not his mother, it's Jason. Nicholas asks if he can pick him up in the car because he's tired, but, but Jason one. denies the favor. That was also the last time Nicholas was seen from experience. The young boy was no stranger to disappearing into thin air for a few days. So Beverly, his mother, doesn't even care much. You know, he's probably somewhere. He's probably doing some stunt. He's so scared. Yeah. It was typical behavior for Nicholas to run away from his problems. The strange thing, however, was the fact that in his pocket, the young boy had not a single dollar. He had not taken anything with him to disappear. He simply vanished into thin air. Nicholas's family reported his disappearance only three days later. Try! On June 13th, Milano Santo Nofatro, his mother, Beverly, had suggested to the officers that her son had probably taken a ride with a stranger. He had then gone who knows where. Months passed, however, and there was no news of Nicholas until September 25th, when it was Jason who called the police to tell them that he had seen him while he was trying to get into the garage of their house when he had then turned to him, his brother had left. Running away again, investigators immediately rushed at the Berkeley family home to see where the boy was and especially why he had run away again, but they found no trace of him. Time went by and unfortunately the search was called off. Nicholas's was a cold case for a very long time now and the chances of finding him had become very slim. His disappearance was then attributed to a voluntary escape. His brother had seen him returning home. He had left here one more time. And so it was simply thought that he was a bad boy who decided to disappear into thin air and throw himself into rosy circles more than three. Years go by without any news of young Nicholas. Then suddenly in October of 1,997, a shocking, shocking, unbelievable thing happens. Investigators in San Antonio in Texas receive a phone call 
On the other end of the phone is the director of a shelter for from Linares in Andalusia. Nicholas has been found. According to what the man on the other end of the phone had said, Nicholas had escaped from a nasty juvenile prostitution ring, and he was completely devastated. Of course, investigators immediately call Nicholas's family, and the first to answer is his sister Carrie, who had been working with all her strength and more over the past few years to find her missing brother. Obviously, this news gives her so much joy, and immediately she tries to talk on the phone with Nicholas, who is on the other side of the world. And Carrie talks to him and is convinced it's him, it's Nicholas. She then asks for a loan from her working doctor to buy a plane ticket directly to Europe. And her only goal is to reboot her brother and bring him home upon her arrival in Spain. Carrie sees again her brother. He was a little older than the way she had left him, and his English had gotten so much worse. He was shy. He kept trying not to be seen, not to talk. And it was obvious something had happened to him, probably the trauma of this child prostitution ring. For three years had devastated him so much that it had given him problems speaking, problems communicating, problems interacting with other people, his eyes even. They were no longer blue, they were brown. What had happened to young Nicholas? Only one thing he could say, they've done some strange experiments on me. I don't know what they've done to me, Carrie, though. She's happy on unimaginable levels. She's found her brother at last after three years and wants to do everything to make him come home. On October 18th of 997,000, the two of them return to St. Anthony's in Texas, Texas where an anxious and hopeful family waits for them. Try. And here you can see the original photos from that moment. Everything. Normally something about him didn't quite fit 100% with the old memory one had of the boy, but the elements of Nicholas were there. The nose was similar to Uncle Pat's. There was his T-shaped tattoo, and he remembered so many things despite the traumas at the airport. Brian and Carrie's husband, their two children, waited with anticipation. Even Beverly Nicholas's mother was there, full of hopes and questions. Missing, however, is only one person, Jason, and it would be two months before the two met again. Probably Jason felt guilty. If he'd picked him up at the playground well. that day, nothing would have happened. He wouldn't have ended up on that strange European tour. He wouldn't have come back three years later at home. And what Nicholas told, what happened to him? In those three years is leaving the family in shock. He told how he couldn't speak English for years and how he, having undergone a forced change of eye color to hide his identity and assume a new one, he also told of strange scientific experiments and claimed that he had been kidnapped and drawn into a European network of pedophilia and child prostitution. This whole case obviously makes the rounds in the US. The missing boy has, has been found. And today he is completely devastated at what happened to him. And the news is interested and journalists are interested too. One of them is Art Copy, a TV show that was very interested in this case. However, when Art Copy hired private investigator Charlie Parker to investigate, the air starts to get a little more sinister, sinister. There is actually something behind this whole story and above all, there is another detail that catches the attention of the investigator Parker. An old photograph of Nicholas as a child leaning Crony. on a shelf. Parker picks up that photograph and notices some differences. The ears of young Nicholas did not match at all with the ears of 16 year old Nicholas. And above all the eyes, how could they have changed from being blue to Roni Parker? Then decides to be a 100% investigator. He then contacts various ophthalmologists, asking a simple but crucial question. Is it possible to change the color of someone's eyes through chemical injections or other experiments? The unanimous answer is in the 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 in another name. His name was Frederick Bourdain known to Interpol as the Chameleon, a serial identity thief who over the years has impersonated more than 100 different people. And best of all, Frederick was not 16, he was over 25. But what had happened? 
Stopped in Spain, Frederick Bourdin did not want to show his papers to avoid being arrested, and so, sifting through missing persons reports as he had done in the past, he bounced into Nicholas Berkeley's story and had decided that it would become his new identity. The flyer described various identifying features of the boy, including a cross tattooed between Nicholas Berkeley's right index finger and thumb. However, the photo was in black and white and Frederick did not know that the boy actually had blue eyes and more importantly, that he was pious. In a panic, when he got the first color photo, he decided to bleach his hair and get a blonde. He improvised in a manner similar to that of the missing yes! young Nicholas and invented a strange story to justify the change in eye color. Besides, who could deny the truth of a poor child being kidnapped by a pedophile boy? He was not convinced that this story would work. He was very doubtful, especially because there were several elements that were blatantly different from the original Nicholas. And it is easy to see the differences. That is, you really notice that there is something wrong between these two people, they are not alike. But then his sister Carrie had arrived and she had recognized him, she had said, yes, you are my brother. Carrie had given her word and not even the Spanish officials, not even the American officials had dared to question her. Not even the FBI had tried to say, hey, maybe this guy is not your brother. No, they had given her an American ID and he had returned to the United States. But how had the family missed the act? How was it possible that no one within the family had said, you are not my brother? I don't know about you guys, but if I go back to my sister one day and suddenly she has blue eyes and doesn't speak Italian well but has a strange Portuguese accent, you questions me. Actually, are we sure it's you, Julia? Instead, with me, it could happen, because I completely redo my face every three months, so this stuff could work. But back to Charlie Parker, the investigator. What does he tell him on the phone to Beverly, well, Nicholas's mother? And Beverly has no intention of listening to him. No, that's my baby right there. Who are you? You don't allow yourself. And at first, no one listens to Parker. Literally no one, except for one person, Frederick Bourdin, just him. At first, he was even putting up with the fact that he could hold his own, that he could pretend to be Nicholas. But the more time passed, the more this whole thing began to crush him. Throughout his time in Bourdain's family, he had met Jason only once and realized that Jason understood that he was not his brother. He pretended that he was. Later, thank to you. Detective Parker, Frederick Borden would say that he thought Jason knew what had really happened to Nicholas. Sorry. Frederick Borden, who an is apology. still pretending to be Nicholas, is taken to a psychiatrist in Florence by an FBI agent who states with uncertainty that the boy said he was indeed. However, the no, thank family, you. informed of this expertise without consent, goes into a rage and rejects any request to have the boy DNA tested. And even when the FBI shows up with a judge's warrant at the Berkeley home, Beverly freaks out, throws herself on the floor, starts screaming, and refuses in any way that the boy should have blood taken for a DNA test. But if you are sure he is your son, issue. True fact that the FBI was now 100% certain that that could yes. not be Nicholas Berkeley. But there was a problem. Who was it then? Is he an infiltrator who entered the United States for no reason? Or so is he a spy? Four months after Frederick Bourdain arrived in the United States under the guise of Nicholas Berkeley, the FBI finally managed to get a chance to do a DNA test. However, on March 5, 998, five months after his staging began, Bourdain is there and spills the beans. I am Frederick Bourdain and I am wanted by Interpol. He told Detective Parker about it, who immediately called the FBI, and once he was in the custody of the agents, the Cabal Hunter, because that's what Interpol called him, told them that according to him, Jason and Beverly, that is, Nicholas's mother and brother, had pretended to believe Nicholas. They knew perfectly well that he was not, in fact, they probably wanted to hide a murder. Believing a pathological liar, however, begins an investigation into the murder of Nicholas Berkeley. 
Both Beverly and Jason were arrested and their testimonies were highly controversial. Then suddenly a new twist. A few weeks after this shocking discovery, Jason died of a cocaine overdose. Was he afraid of being found out that he had done something to his brother? Did someone want him to keep Thank quiet? Thank you, one will! Investigators began to ask such questions, but only Jason could have given the answer, and unfortunately he was no longer alive to give it. Beverly later stated that he had always justified the changes in the young man because of what had happened to him during those three years of alleged child racketeering, and he also said that never for a second had he doubted that that Frenchman disguised as a 16-year-old but who was actually 23 could not be his son. That was his child. Of course, the investigation continued, but absolutely nothing came of it, especially as far as the alleged murder of Nicholas was concerned. Today, the boy is still in the missing persons echo and would be four years old. And what On September 9, Mill 998, Frederick Borden, in a St. Anthony court, pleaded guilty to perjury and possession of documents in Farsi, Convicted. sentenced to six years in prison. He returned to live in France in October 2003 after serving his sentence and then decided to impersonate a child again. You should know that Frederick Borden actually impersonated children for the rest of his existence and continued to impersonate always, always, always. It is a super peculiar and very disturbing story to be able to investigate his whole past. There are articles and interviews I've read that leave you completely in awe of what he was doing and inventing. It almost makes you admire him because he looks like an artist. In 2003, he impersonated, for example, a 14-year-old boy, and you have to think he was 30. Ma belle, Leo belle. Belli, who had disappeared almost eight years earlier on a camping trip. This time, the police quickly gave him a DNA test that quickly revealed that he was, in fact, Frederick Borden. And Leo Belli joins the multiple identities that Frederick Borden assumed during his existence and is probably still doing now. And there are so many of them. I found news about a priest, a tiger tamer, he did a lot of them Raga, and his hitter was always pretty much the same. Posing as a missing child, phoning the eventual parents or investigators himself doing the grown man voice. And yes, he was the one who had called the investigators looking for Nicholas. He was always extraordinarily adept at being able to change identities. Changing his weight, changing his appearance, cutting his beard, his mustache, his hair, coloring it. He liked you to say, beautiful. I can become anyone I want. You have to think that when he had pretended but to be what? the 14 year old boy, Leo Belli, never Niccolo had examined and declared him a 14 year old boy. He was 30. The most incredible thing of all, however, is one in my opinion. Usually people deceive and cheat for money. Frederick Borden never stole a euro in his entire life. His profit was probably merely emotional, nothing more. And when we think that Nicholas will have been reported missing on Frederick Borden's birthday, it gives a bit of a chill. Borden should be married with children today. For a while he is continuing to impersonate a... Uh... But he's not the only person. Yes. And that's it guys. Let me know down in the comments what you think of this hallucinating story. I know it's upsetting, but it's fascinating as hell. I'm sorry all to summarize so much because Frederick Borden's life I think is extremely fascinating and here is just a slice of everything he did. Let me know down in the comments, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, a new video comes out on Tuesdays, Quints and Saturdays 10.30. In the meantime I say this nobody ever knows, I send a big kiss to everyone and see you in the next video. Hi!